One o'clock right on the nose, Danny Grimes coming to you from Fort Myers, Naples and our script. Actually, my new logo that you've seen maybe around a little bit, Danny delivers results. The bottom line here, you guys, is I want your business to have results. That's why we do this. And I appreciate you guys investing your time. I've got some steady eddies, been on almost every one of my calls for the last five or six months. And I've watched many of them, including my team, progress a long way with the question-based listening enhanced conversational scripts. So a couple of things I wanna cover a couple, uh, with you right off the bat. So take some notes because the schedule is gonna change a little bit. So obviously we have Tuesday, Thursday's class. However, this Thursday's class will not be the script class that we're doing right now. It's gonna be a class that I do with my wife, Kristen Cole from one to three Eastern time. It's called Thrive. Now it's cost $29 to get in. However, as I mentioned last week, if you were on the call last week, because I'm kind of, it's kind of preempting our class and I don't want to miss our time together. If you want to attend this class next, uh, this Thursday coming up day after tomorrow, you can attend for free. Now here's what I'm going to have you do. Um, and I don't know exactly the link. However, my assistant right here, if you can read that, it's Ann, I'm sorry, it's dgt.nanne trust, T-R-U-S-T at gmail.com. Um, would you email her and say you would like to be part of the Thrive class and you're part of Denny's group here? And I'm sure you're going to have a link to go in. What's Thrive? Some of the stuff that you've heard me speak before, talking about really how to th uh, thrive in any market. And of course, Kristen has some other things to add that you probably have not heard before. So if you have the time and can pop on and you want to pop on, uh, please do so. So that'll be this Thursday, okay? Now, in fact, here is, I don't know if this is gonna be the active link. I did find this in my email that the code is KCN Thrive. However, I'm not sure if that's the code you put into Zoom or not. So again, please email um, and Sunny, if you would be kind enough, or Shabani, if you're there, to put Ann's email in the chat, just in case it wasn't coming out large enough on the screen. Right now, I'm looking at my slideshow, not my screen. So I trust that you could see it. If not, it'll be in the chat. Then, of course, next week already is Thanksgiving, and I'm going to be on vacation and um, in Mexico. I know that I'll have cell service there. I don't know how great the Zoom call will be. So rather than tax that situation, where I'm going to skip the calls next week and you can focus on your family and doing whatever you want to do and put your script uh, skills maybe aside uh, for that week. And then moving into December, watch this, Tuesday class, and I would recommend you take a screenshot of this uh, or just with your camera, take a picture of it. Tuesday class is going to go on starting December, the 1st, 8th, 15th. And we're going to skip Christmas week. I debated about the 29th. However, I, I didn't want to slough off the very last week of the year because I want you to be super sharp as we start 2021. So the Tuesday class will be going on just like that every day in December, except the week of Christmas. The Thursday class is gonna change a little bit. It's going to be a black belt scripting class. What I did, it's kind of some of the stuff we're doing. You're welcome to participate. I posted in the bold, uh, Facebook group for the people that have been through Bold, kind of a benefit, a little bonus I'm going to give them is that scripting is the number one thing from all the feedback we see in the chat. They love the scripting. Uh, they love the mindset aspect of Bold and scripting. Those are the one and two things. So what I'm offering them is to go a little bit deeper in a black belt advanced script class. You have been getting a lot of the advanced stuff too. So again, this will be like your Thursday class. I'm just inviting another small group to be part of it. So going back to, sorry about the cheese there, going back to the dates, uh, I'm gonna start this tomorrow from four to five Eastern time. And again, if, you would like to, if you'd like to be part of that class tomorrow, you can just email Ann, you'll have the link and you'll get the link for the following classes it will be December 3rd, 10th and 17th. Those will all be the one to two o'clock. I'm attempting to keep it non-confusing. This week I had to change it uh, from four to five because of the, the class Kristen and I are teaching on, on um, Thursday. It was going to conflict. So there'll be Wednesday and then it'll go Thursday, Thursday, Thursday. And that'll be 
the 3rd, 10th, and 17th. So that'll be free, and you're welcome to be a part of that. The other thing that I, um, I was contacted by, and probably a lot of people were the RS or CRS Council, if you wanted to be part of some, some sort of the publications they're putting together. And I made a list of 10 things that I think agents should have a high level of understanding. And these are kind of the axioms that, that we talk about a lot and probably will be an outline I'll go through with the black belt class where people can understand certain things like you already understand there's only three outcomes when you list a home, question-based scripting, um, setting expectations, not prices, um, uh, how to take a listing, how to have the dialogue with a seller who's aggressive with and without motivation, um, the use or the proper use of a CMA, the efficiency of the market and the time activity curve. Those are all, I think, staples to really make you kind of a bulletproof individual on a presentation. So I know that's why you signed up. So that will be what some of the topics will be in the black belt class. Some of those you've heard before, it won't hurt you to hear, hear them again so you can master them. Now for the big cheese, here's, the, here's, my, here's my concept today. So as I start thinking about that, people that get into real estate, you realize that, as you know, a lot of people, particularly in states like Florida, maybe Arizona, California, maybe every state, I don't know. It's like everybody has a real estate license. Why? Well, they did a survey and they found out the two main reasons people get into real estate. Number one reason is, what is it? Make money, right? And the number two reason is they like working with people. And the third reason, what most people think is the second reason, however, it's a close third, is freedom. They can be their own boss. And the last I read, the statistics are that 50% of real estate people aren't in it full time anymore after a year. 90% of the real estate folks that get in are not in it full time anymore after five years. Well, they went and rounded all those people up and said, hey, why aren't you in real estate anymore? The number one reason was they weren't in real estate full-time anymore, or maybe not at all, was they're not making any money. The second reason was, haha, they're not, they don't like people anymore. And so here's my, here's my concept, why I think people get into real estate and why they fail. If that big ball of cheese right there, that cheese wheel, it represents your market, all the potential buyers and sellers in your market. Now, again, all markets are different. Like my wife is originally from Alaska where they had, I don't know, six or 16,000 people. We have more than a, at a red light here. So we have somewhere between uh, 25,000 transactions, maybe in the MLS between homes and condos. So there's a lot of transactions. That big cheese wheel would represent 25,000 transactions. How many does an agent really need? Well, I think every agent I mean, it's impossible to fail at real estate, you're right? You can only quit. So I think any agent that really wants to and just put a, to apply themselves, as I look at agents with that type of a, a, a grit to be a century agent, I think 100 homes are possible for every one of you. And I know some markets like California, you know, you only have to sell like five homes to be super rich. Generally speaking, though, I think 100 homes, if you could do 30, you can do 100. Now, that may not be what you want to do. So if, if you have a market of 15, 20, or 25,000 transactions, you only need a fraction of those transactions to be super successful. However, now you can tell me what you think of this. This is my first time going through this as attempting to get across the idea. So really, when you look at the, the, the big cheese wheel is all of the market, we don't represent all of the market geographically. We don't cover certain areas. There's no way we can know everyone. So there's gonna be a slice of that market that we could maybe have an impact on an influence over if we were to be proactive about our lead generation, right? Those, there are those two words again, lead generation. However, I think what attracts people into real estate is they hear about people that are making 15, $20,000 on a commission. They have friends that basically talk to them about real estate. They hear their friends or neighbors or whatever talk about how um, they just bought a house or want to buy a house. So watch the next slide here. This is what happens. 
So when you think about that big cheese wheel, then you break it down into the little wedge, which is about maybe 20% of what we actually have influence or maybe impact over. Now, now we're gonna take the little cheese slicer. We're gonna cut off a segment of that. And I don't know if you can read it on my TV. That's the number of people that maybe you know in your sphere, right? And so again, you don't have to have a huge piece. However, this is the mentality I think people get into real estate. So they've come in contact with people. They've talked to people that bought a home. They're going cha-ching in their mind, multiplying the commission times their friends. However, when you stop to think about it, a sliver of the sliver is what the agents really have in their database. And I'll put the air quotes on that. Now, understand this. When I don't care who you are, if you get into real estate, there's going to be a segment maybe an itty bitty segment of a piece of a segment of people that will tolerate us in spite of how bad we are. They will tolerate us in spite of how new we are and how we fumble through the first few transactions. You know what I mean, right? Could be relatives and friends. However, when you get beyond that inner circle, and I had a cousin that didn't buy from me, so you're not guaranteed to even do business with your family and friends. <laughs> However, when you get beyond that little sliver, now people are expecting a little bit more of us. Like number one, there might be competition. I mean, if your mom or dad or your grandparents are selling their home, I trust they're not interviewing too many more agents other than you. Unless you have the Waltons times 10, I'm probably dating myself. Who remembers the Waltons? Big family, night John boy. You know what I mean, right? So unless you have a huge family, your business isn't going to, isn't going to uh, take off to the stratosphere because there's at some point in time, you have to get outside the people that will love you no matter what. That's what lead generation is. And that's where, the, that's where basically the wheels fall off because now you have to go and talk to people that aren't going to do business with you just because of your last name. Now, what's awesome about what we've been working on for the last several weeks and months is this, winning at the table. So what we want to do is develop the mindset, right? And, you're, and you're, by you faithfully showing up and learning the the thoughts and the strategies behind our conversations, it helps you win at the table. My question is, the only way to get to the table is to get a bigger family. Well, they'll just invite you over for Thanksgiving, which may not be legal this year. I don't know. Or you're going to have to develop the art of scripting for lead generation. Now, we can, we can work into that more. Most of the stuff we've been working on, and this is because this is kind of where I cut my teeth, was not lead generations, like making the calls. And I want to get better at that so I can help you get better at that. Um, we, have been, we have been focused at winning at the table. So if you're not getting the appointments, the challenge is going to be make the calls to start cutting in and making the, your, your database bigger. Because your family and friends, I, I heard it like last year in bold, the NER said it was every 10 years. Now I read this past week, it's every 13 years. So if you're, if you're patient, your family will buy again every 13 years. It's just not going to give you the level of income that you want. So what we want to do is make sure we're putting into action what we're learning. So if you want a bigger business, you're going to have to get a bigger piece of the cheese, and that's going to be growing and expanding your database. Uh, one thing that we can work on, and I've got one more point and we're going to go on, is if you've not really expanded and, and monopolized your sphere, the people in your phone, the people that are closest to you, that is your next best um, area of low-hanging fruit. Even the ones we talked about before, the shadow sellers, those that should be, could be, etc., the last point I want to make on this is this. What we're doing here, although I think we, we sometimes, I sometimes use on a slide script practice and role play. It really isn't script practice. I would challenge you to, um, to find someone else that's kind of loyal on these calls. And I know during Bold, you have a script partner. However, if you do not have a script partner, that's script practice. And I, I don't know that you need to, we all need to call in here and have, you know, 20 people or 15 people or however it might grow into reading the scripts. 
This is when you read it over and over and over again. So you have it internalized. You don't have to think about it. It just read it. I read it, you read it. I read it, you read it. Then we might, you know, give each other some feedback. And we spend 30 minutes doing that. That's 15 minutes. You might be able to read a script just over and over again, 10 times, eight times. That's what you should be doing every day. And then when we come into these sessions here, the role play is the strategy of how to deliver the scripts with the nuances, with the tie downs, with the questions. So if you don't have a script partner, I look, look who's on this call right here. If you wanna get with someone who, who wants to master, master like a black belt, their scripts and dialogue. So that's my point on that. Is there, do you guys have any thoughts on that point at all? So if you're new on the call, Danny Delivers YouTube, go there and, and join that and subscribe to that because everything's being um, added to that. You'll notice, obviously, we've talk, talked about, I've got some new equipment, new studio set up here. And so we're going to be working that a little bit more professionally moving forward. And it'll. And I, I'm working, my intent is to drive a higher level of succinct content. So we, we practice pra, uh, question-based, listening-enhanced conversational scripts, and we always follow the model. So if you don't have that, take a picture of that. We do our role play with my team. And if you'd like to pop in one day on, on 8.30 on Eastern time and, and see how we do our script practice and role play, it's really, it really isn't script practice, it's role play. And how we do it with each other, you're welcome to do that because I really believe your, your business and your level of confidence will grow exponentially when you start practicing even with people in your peers, there's a higher likelihood you're actually going to be able to use the scripts in real life. And I only go back to this is because even today, we have new people coming in all the time, and it is not second nature to follow this model. It's not. It, first nature is, acknowledgement is almost kind of automatic. Uh, however, the, the isolation part is where the magic is. So that's why I go over that each and every time. I do want to show you something that's kind of interesting. This headline just came out a couple of days ago. U.S. home prices up 12% most in seven years. Now get your mindset around this just for a little bit. I mean, we have been, I've been teaching, you know, getting sellers off the fence ever since Gary Keller came out in June and said, now's the time to get sellers in the market. We came up with a list of seven reasons why sellers should be in the market now. Now, some people took that message uh, to heart and they basically went and were started talking to their potential sellers. Just imagine, now there's people out there that may want to still move, want to sell the house, their home or, pro or property, and no one's taken them the message yet. You can see where we're coming from contribution is that they have already lost out in, in theory, on average, 12%. And some markets are even more than that. The question is, with this piece of information, how can you use this piece of information right now as you go and talk to people? Maybe, hey, there's seven reasons why sellers should be in the market now and one of the prices is going up. And Mr. And Mrs. Seller, you know, uh, there was just an article in the paper on, on average, the home prices were up 12% over the last, it's probably month over month, the highest percentage in seven years. Now, let me ask you this. Would you, would you, would you have rather been on the market two or three months ago or now? When's the best time to put your home on the market is the same answer as when's the best time to plant an apple tree, right? 20 years ago or now? And if, people, if, you, if you have been or agents have been timid of taking this news to potential sellers, you can see that we've cost them some money and us some money. Listen, the election's over. I don't know what the outcome's going to be. I don't know how long that's going to go on. However, the economy hasn't crashed and burned. We will, we will live through this one way or the other. And there's even positive signs like the market is still chugging away. So it's not too late for sellers. I encourage you to use this information to your benefit. Now, um, I'm going to get off this here just for a second so I can see you guys. Wow, we got a lot of people here today. 
And I thought we'd do a little bit of a role play. I need someone to be a seller. And this came up by one of our agents. And actually, we practiced it. I thought it was a good one. I'm going to do... I want to do a role play with a potential seller. You can be the seller. And I, I want, I want, I need two people. I need one person to be the seller that wants to overprice, wants to be aggressive with their home. And maybe their motivation isn't that great, right? And then I want someone else to be a, a, a seller. And I'll let you, I'll tell you what, you can be the seller and throw out any objection you want to throw out. Fair enough. So I'll take the hard part and I'll, I'll be the agent. I will model for you meeting with a seller that wants, that wants more for their property than the market will bear and their motivation. They may not have motivation. Okay. Do I have a volunteer to mic up and be that seller? Come on. I'll be your seller. Okay. And who is that? Bob Crane. Bob? Yeah, Bob. Okay, Bob. All right, Bob. Hey, listen, I just given the presentation. We're at your kitchen table. And I'm, I'm going to say, uh, Bob, are you ready to get going today? I think I am. Awesome. So, all right. So have you made the decision to hire me to get your home sold? Yes. All right. So as we went over, now again, I'm not a big believer in CMAs, although you do have to have some information you take them, right? So we went over, we went over the sales up in your neighborhood. Where did you want to position your home? I'd like to get 425. 425, I understand. Now, as, as you recall, when we went over your past sales, all of those sales had one thing in, com in common. You know what it was? They all had a three in front of it. Were you aware, did you, did you make note of that? I did. I think our house is a little better than those though. Okay, I understand. Well, let me ask you this. They, um, because we didn't really spend a lot of time talking about this. When you sell your home, where are you going next? Um, Alaska. Where in Alaska? Wasilla. Oh my gosh. It's pretty cold there now. I think it was like zero this morning. So awesome. And when would you like to be there, Bob? Well, I'm not in a big hurry. Whenever I get the price I want on my home here, I'll be packing. And what is what is the what is the reason? What's the motivation to go to the, such a wonderful area like Wasilla, Alaska? Oh, it just seems like a nice place to be. And you know, you're would you? So you're totally flexible, but when you get there, right? Yep. And how will you feel when you're there? Apparently, I'll feel a little cold. Okay. So let me ask you then, so congratulations on that. I'm a little bit jealous. So at 425, would you not, would you not agree that that is an aggressive number relative to the homes that have sold in your neighborhood? I think so, but you know, as you said, prices are up 12%. They've been rising, rising for the last year or so here, and I'm confident you can do it, Denny. Well, if you sold it at 425, you would win, right? Yes, I would. And if the market absorbed it at 425, I would win too, right? Absolutely. So we're on the same team. However, let's talk about this. What will you do if the market says no, Bob? Oh, I'll have to reevaluate and decide if I want to deal with the market or if I want to pull it off and stick around. Okay. And how long would it take you to come to that conclusion? Probably six months. Okay. So I'm going to ask, I'm kind of curious. Let me, let me ask you this. And people ask me, I'm stepping out of role here a little bit. I know we say that a lot. And you don't have to say, let me ask you every time. And I don't want to make, I don't, I don't want that to be a crutch. So although it does flow, 
Although don't feel like you have to do it. I am okay. curious, Bob. Obviously, we'd both win at 425. And you know, we don't make the market, right? The market right. makes the market. But let me ask, how will you feel toward me in six months that the market said no and you were at 425 and it's, it's still for sale? How would you look towards me as your agent after being exposed to the market at 425? Would you, would you say, Danny, I think you're a great guy. Thanks so much for taking this project on because I know I was aggressive and my number probably might have been more aggressive than the market. And you'll knock about me and make sure you use me when the time is right and refer me to your friends. That would be on one end. Or on the other end of the spectrum, you're going to think deep in your bone, heart of hearts that, you know, I must have had the wrong agent because he couldn't get me 425. What would you, what would be your opinion of me in six months? I would respect you for giving it a good try. Okay. Now I'm going to pop out a roll just a little bit. Okay. I ask that question many times to sellers because many times if what, and listen, you can take, you can take an aggressive listing if you want. It's motivation. We haven't really dug into that a whole lot yet. I've got one more card delay. And I've seen in this market, things happen you can't really explain. However, the thing that drives me crazy and drives my blood pressure crazy is this, is that when you work with buyers and they don't follow your advice, they don't get the home in a multiple offer situation and they blame you. You work with sellers that want more than the market is worth. They want you to be Helen Keller, the miracle worker, and you can't deliver that. And are they upset with you? I don't want you to lose business because you're attempting to give it a shot for them. And too many times I've been on the short end of that stick because I didn't have a conversation. So let me ask you this. So we're going to expose it. I'll go through the three outcomes. And so you, your doctor, you know, if you went to a doctor and they were give you a new, a new medicine and would you want the doctor to take a few minutes to explain the potential side effects of that prescription before you took the pill? Absolutely. So do you, I'm not your doctor. However, I am your real estate professional. Do you mind if we have a conversation about the pot uh, potential side effects of you asking more than a market will bear? Absolutely. I, I, I brought you in here just because you're the expert. I'd like to hear what you have to say. So for people that have been on the calls before, it's going to be, don't assume they know, and I'm demonstrating the question so you know how to use it. So when you look out there and look at the market, and there's no wrong or right answer. This is the meat thermometer. Do you think the market favors sellers right now? Or do you think the market's working against sellers? I think it favors sellers. Yes, we're in a seller's market, right? In fact, you know, you quoted the article that, that we talked about in the listing presentation, prices are up and the market's kind of white hot right now. How would you feel if you missed out on that? Right now, you can cash in at a number probably you've never seen before. How would you feel if you missed out? I'd feel a little disappointed. Right? Well, there's, not, there, there's nothing worse than being able to sell it at, at a, a number and then have to sell it less. That means you left money on the table, right? Right. Is there any sin at selling at the top of the market? Is there any what? Is there any sin in selling it at the top of the market? No, it's just wise business. People brag about that for their whole life to be able to get out when they get in this good. And here, here's what I know. There's a lot of uncertainty out there. Here's the thing I know for sure, Bob, is that you can't win in this market unless you're in, in, in this market. So number one, I can't say that somebody's not going to come around, come along and give you something over 400 or maybe even up to 425. I can't, it may happen. However, if the market says no, and we'll know in a relatively short time because there's three outcomes, would you be willing to have a conversation about repositioning so you can still come out on top? Sure. And how long, if, if the doctor gave you a pill 
that wasn't working? How long would you want to take the wrong pill before you took the right pill? Good point. Not at all. Not long at all. Days, weeks, months, years. How long? Days. So how about if we give it six or seven days? How about if we give it a week? And if we're outcome number one, where it's low to no activity, which means we haven't, I mean, our bait needs to be repositioned, would you be willing to have a conversation then? Yes, I would. So that's how I, now again, if, if he's going to be like 425 or bust and it's too far out of the market, then you may not want to take it. I, I, I am probing just a little bit with him. I'm sensing with him, there could be, once he realizes that, because he's, he's now he's used the, used the term, this is that listening enhance, he's using the term, it wouldn't be smart business. I'm going to remember that. And so in a week, hey, we're still outcome number one. No one's come to see it, Bob. It's time to reposition. Are you ready to take a new pill? Yes. Or no, either one. However, the stronger their motivation, the, st the stronger their motivation, the more willing they are to get real. And again, there's, there's another way to, de to determine a buyer seller's motivation. And that is easy. That's kind of easy. Uh, it, it, I'll just give you the script. If you've not heard it, it's the one to 10. So this would be somewhere in the presentation. I'm just throwing some different angles or um, ideas you can use or different angles of attack. So Bob, let me ask you on a scale of one to 10, you said you wanted to get to Alaska and in one meanings, you know, sometime in the next 20 years and 10, you would like to be there in six months. Where do you find yourself on that scale? Six months. Well, on the scale of one to 10. Oh, one to 10? Probably about a four. Wow. <laughs> you have to, uh, now that surprised me because when he said six months, I thought it would be stronger, like 10 or eight or nine. So what would have to happen, Bob, for you to get to a 10? Ah, uh, I don't know. I'd have to think about that a little bit. Okay, I have time. The, the issue is on the one to 10, the, ten, the, the four doesn't mean anything. Here's what we're going to unpack. What has to happen? Because I want, you're going to want to remember that. Well, I got to sell my house. All right. What else? Well, I have to find a house in Wasilla. Okay. What else? Well, my retirement has to come through, right? What else? Well, I have to get released from my parole. What else? Okay. I mean, there could be a lot of different things, right? And so yep. that level of understanding the motivation, the one to 10 is the best way to bring it out. Now, again, just for this conversation right now, I don't really know where he stands. He's a four. And maybe in a week, I don't know if he'd be ready to lower the price. Every now and then, you're going to have sellers that, all right, I'm going to, I'm going to go now. And we'll end it with this one. Bob, it's 425 or nothing, right? Have you ever had a seller that says, that's what I think it's worth? My grandfather was like that before he passed away. And why? Because in his memory, somebody gave him a verbal offer that probably wasn't realistic. And somehow that set the bar that that's what his property was worth. And there's people out there that develop an emotional attachment for whatever reason. All right. So you have a seller that's 425 and they want to get to a silo. And the only conversation, I think you, you've got to find the pain point. Bob, let me ask you. If 425 is your number and you're, you say you're not moving off that? Did you mute yourself because that was your dog? Uh, if you can convince me. Well, just, just, for the, uh, just say you're not moving off of it. I'm not moving off of it, Denny. Okay. So would that mean then that you're not moving? If the market says no at 425 and it always says no at 425, would that mean you're going to give up on your dream of living in Alaska? No. Now, that, that type of an answer right there gives you some, uh, some, some room to maneuver. Because, because I think that's a valid answer. No, now you, now you would probe. And find out because, again, my silly example, you're watching the Bucks game. The Bucks finally had a decent game. They won. 
and you want to go, they score a touchdown. You want to go get some Cheetos. You don't want to leave the game that you want Cheetos. Well, you got to make a decision. You go get the Cheetos or don't get the Cheetos. There's no one to get them for. You have to make a choice. And the, and the choices are you'll either be hungry or miss part of the game. So thank you, Bob, for that. Now let's go in. This is going to be uh, potluck. I need somebody to be a seller. I've just finished the presentation, and I want you then to um, – Throw out an objection. Anyone, any objection you, you want and anyone can help out and just be the seller. We'll take about five minutes to do this. That sounds great, Denny, but the last agent told me they'd do it for 5%. <laughs> All right, thank you, Brenda. So, Brenda's on my team, and I think we did this. Uh, I think we did this in role play this week. Oh, that's awesome! So, let me ask you: other than other than commission, is there any other reason why you wouldn't be working with me today? Um, yeah, I really don't want to be stuck in a long-term agreement either. Okay, I'm making note of that. So other than the fee and the long-term agreement, what else is keeping us from doing business today? I think that's it. So of those two things, Brenda, which one is really the major issue for you right now? The commission. I see. So if we got together on fee where you felt comfortable with what I earned uh, or what you were paying me, then uh, are you ready to move forward today? Yes. And again, the model is pretty, pretty simple. Acknowledge, isolate. Now, again, they can be lying. However, make a note. Don't answer objections unless you get the commitment if that, if, that if we can solve that issue, are you ready to move forward? Because if they give you a no, what does that mean? There's, there's, there's something else that may, you may have to deal with. And so if you've ever been on a presentation where you're going through this and you're like, you're knocking all these things down, there's always another obstacle, you probably because you didn't flush them out. So, let, so, okay, so there's a couple of ways to do this. I'll just do, you said the other agent uh, said they do it for 5%? Yes. Linda? Now, is that their fee or did they, did they offer, uh, have a higher fee and you ask them to come down? I ask them to come down. Okay. And so are you, uh, hmm. I'm gonna go this direction. So that's a little concerning to me, I think, Brenda. Why is that? Well, would you want an agent that basically knew how to negotiate your equity so you could put the most money in your pocket? Oh, yeah, absolutely. That would be, other than getting your house exposed into marketing, you'd want somebody to be able to stand up for the value of your home, wouldn't you? Yeah, for sure. Well, you, are you at all concerned that an agent that you're going to be have him represent or her represent thousands of dollars worth of your equity, he was willing to take away one-third of his income from his family just because you ask him to. Oh, by the way, you're not a professional negotiator, are you? No. So do you feel like that was a benefit to you because he gave up his family's money because you ask? How will he perform against a professional negotiator, which will be another real estate agent representing the buyer? How fast do you think he will give away your money? Well, I had thought it was a benefit to me, but now that you put it this way, I hadn't thought about it that way. So that makes sense. Well, can I give you a better way to look at it? Yes. And this is what a lot of sellers just don't realize because they're focusing on what they pay. What's the most important thing for you? What you pay to sell your home or how much money you put in your pocket when you walk away from closing? How much money I put in my pocket. So if, so if somebody had a was a better agent, a better negotiator, uh, had stronger buyers that could basically maybe sell your house and net you more money, maybe one, two or 3% more than an, 
a less qualified agent, do you think they might be worth 1% more? Absolutely. So if I can demonstrate to you that I'm that agent, are you okay moving forward with, with our fee that's on the contract? Yes. Now you'll have to go in to demonstrate that and there's ways that you do that and make notes. I mean, it's qu quite, it, many times you don't have to go that far. Obviously you can say, no, are you ready to proceed anyway? And they might be willing to proceed. However, I'm not really teaching you scripts. Sometimes backbone works too, right? I'm, I'm attempting to give you different paths to go down and then, you know, you don't have to use them all. You can just say no. Are you ready to move forward with me so we can get your home on the market right away? Now, one thing I want all agents to kind of know is this, just to re if you're particularly if you're new, there's more than one negotiation in every contract. There's probably at least three. Number one is your negotiation, there's gonna be four, your negotiation with the seller as far as where they list. And you know me, I don't set prices, I set expectations. So if you wanna have that role play as a seller pressing me on price, we'll do that. The second negotiation is going to be when obviously the buyer comes in or the buyer's agent has a buyer and they're going to have maybe an offer less than full price. You may have multiple offers over full price. Still, there'll be points in negotiation. Number three, there's going to be the negotiation of the inspection items. And four, maybe there's going to be the negotiation of an appraisal if the appraisal's uh, somewhat low. So believe me, do not undersell your ability to negotiate. And as someone who's not a professional negotiator, it, it, isn't it stronger to say one third of their family's income versus 1%? 1% sounds like 1%. When you say it's one third of his family's income, I mean, you wouldn't want to lose one third of your equity, would you? So thank you, Brenda. That was familiar. <laughs> So anybody have a seller objection they want to throw out there, then we can role play it. If not, and I'll give you a second to do that, or you can put it in the chat if you don't, if you don't want to speak. Other than that, we can maybe do uh, our potluck game. Let's see, yeah, we have 15 minutes. So anybody have a situation of role play you'd like to see done from a seller or buyer perspective? You guys are so quiet. You're so quiet. I bet you're not quiet in church at all. All right. We didn't make it through last week. The top seven objections, most common objections in a real estate transaction. Do we have anybody that would like to step up and be the agent here and participate? And I'll throw you an objection. Okay, well, here's a question. So while you're, while you're getting the guts to do that, <laughs> how is it one third of the family's income? Well, yeah, well, all right. So just assume in our case, we take a, a three, um, a third, 6% um, listing. So we, a third of it would be, I mean, half of it would be 3%. If they gave up a point, that would be a third, right? So that's where I get that. Um, if the 3% standard, but it, isn't it five? Uh, oh, I see, I see, I see. Well, she's asking the question, if, if they do it at 5%, which is another avenue you could go. This is an awesome question, you guys. What she's asking, you can see it in the chat. Let's say, okay, I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what, Brenda, I'll do it for 5%. Well, you ask them, you know, um, you ask them, well, they're gonna discount it at a 1%, right? Are they gonna take that off the buyer's fee or off their fee? And nine and a half or 9.9 .9 times out of 100, you're going to ask the seller that question. I said, I don't really know. Oh, I mean, so really, maybe they're dis discounting the commission for the buyers. Are you really want to, you want to make your home less attractive to the buyer's agents out there? So I just assumed in this role play, the 1% was going to come off the listing side, although that would be another angle. And the fact that the seller does not know will add a, a little bit of a question of doubt. Anybody brave? Want to do a five-minute role play? 
I'll throw one at you. Then anyone want to be a seller? I'll then you can be the seller, and I'll, I'll give you I'll give you the objection. That's the easy part, guys. That's like the tree in your in your play in elementary school. I can't do it by myself. Kind of hard. Yeah, yeah, I'll do it. All right, Kevin, you're the seller. Yes, sir. All right, so this is a, kind of can be an extension of the one we just did. Your objection is I don't want to lower my price. Right? Last, That's last right. call. But you want to take that as the agent. Kevin's going to say, I don't want to lower my price. Have you ever had a seller say that? Okay, well, I'm kind of indifferent about this. And again, my rule is that they have to want to sell more than you than you want them to sell. And because obviously there's a reason they want, want to sell, right? So Kevin, so you don't want to lower their you don't want to lower your price? That's right. Yes, sir. Well, tell me more about that. I mean, currently we're listed at 550. You're in San Francisco. So we're, we're listed at 850 and we've had it on the market now 45 days and had one showing. When you go to the three outcomes, what does that suggest? It suggests that maybe I have the wrong broker. <laughs> okay. Well, okay. Well, tell me more about that. It seems how many um, clients have we seen come through the house? We've had one showing in 45 days. Does that speak more about the broker or about the, the price? Now, or God now forbid. this is a cool conversation, guys, because this is exactly the position a seller can take. I want you to be able to defend it. Now, again, when you look at the bell-shaped curve, Generally, the people that are normal, friendly, rational are kind of in the middle. On the outliers, you have crazy. Can't fix crazy, and you can't, you can't do anything with crazy other than fire them. However, this is, a, this is a realistic conversation, and why you should, I encourage you to use the one of three things sheet at the beginning of the listing. So I'm just gonna take it from there. So do you, you feel like, okay, that maybe I'm not doing my job because there's only been one showing in 45 days. Am I hearing you right, Kevin? Yes, but I have one question. Do you want me to be at seven, eight, nine, or 10 on this? You're talking about motivated to sell or, or, or uh, how, how, uh, um, how difficult you want to be? How difficult, the difficulty factor. Well, will you guys put in the chat at least a number? How difficult do you want them to be? We got time. Give me some numbers. Seven, eight, nine, or ten. Ten million like, like he's Freddy Krueger. I like eight, to be nine personally. Eight, eight, ten, Rachel. Man, bad. All right. So be a nine. Thank you. So so you think basically it's my fault people haven't come to see your home? I wouldn't say it's your fault. I would just say that's the outcome. And I want to, I don't want to put blame at anywhere. What would you like to see me do different? Sell a house. Okay. And what, what do you think that you, obviously you've sold houses before. What you, in your mind should be happening that's not? One client in what, 60 days. Sounds like it's an advertising problem. Okay. Lack of advertising, correct placement of advertising. So you're judging me on the marketing. I'm not marketing enough. Am I hearing you right? Yeah. Yes, that would be correct. Okay. So... Do you remember when we sat down and we talked about it every week since in our follow-up call, the three outcomes? Remember we talked about that? The first outcome is low the no showings. The second outcome is showings and no offers. And the third outcome, it sells. What outcome are we at? We're at the outcome of no showings. But I just spoke with a broker a couple of days ago and he guarantees me he can get my price. 
and you can do it pretty quickly. Really? Now, is that broker then, what you're suggesting is that broker then must have a buyer if he can suggest that, correct? He did not mention that, but he said he did have clients that would be interested. And how many times- And I broker, asked him like- Yeah, and how many times I'm has sorry. his broker showed your house in the last 45 days? That was my concern, once. He, no, was that the broker who showed it one time? Yeah, that was the broker that showed it um, one time or, yeah. So do you think it's a little bit fishy that someone has, I got all these clients for your house. However, I'm not going to, I don't really know where they are until you give me the listing. Does that sound a little suspicious? It does, but you also have to realize there's about 50,000 um, um, brokers in this area. So, yes. um, and you know a what? A huge amount of them could be doing it wrong and correct. That's what concerns me. There's 50,000 oh, so. 50, agents around here. And how many, between me and those 50,000 agents, how many of them brought a buyer through your home? One person, one broker. Doesn't sound like a really high percentage, does it? So let's go back. It doesn't. Outcome number it makes one me is... Think I don't go mean on. to be interrupting. I'm just it. trying to go faster. So outcome yeah, number one is low to no showings. Now, my question to you is, what would you say if I, if I told you you didn't have one showing? You had 125 showings. Would you feel better about me as an agent if you had 125 showings? I would. Well, as this, does, this sheet shows you right here over the last 45 days, 125 people have basically knocked on your cyber door and taken the virtual tour and walked through your home and looked at it. And as they left and closed the front door and they went on to the other home, they all had the same reaction except for one. You know what that was? They didn't like it. They didn't like it. So imagine that hurt. If, if you imagine if you had a retail store and on this rack you had a nice jacket, you had a brand new jacket on the rack. And 125 people tried it on. And they, they try it on, they look at the price tag, they put it back on the rack 125 times. Do you have a traffic problem? Or in other words, do we have a marketing problem? No. Well, maybe it's just the environment, the Zoom, et cetera. That may be the marketing problem. So People when you, aren't used to when you, I'm, I'm going a little fast here. So when you yeah, are um, sell this house, you're going where? I am going to San Diego. And are you going to buy a home there? Yes, sir. Have you been shopping online? I have not. Will you shop online? Probably not. Seriously? So it doesn't really matter. To shop on. It doesn't really matter. It doesn't, Kevin doesn't matter. So when you shop for a home and you find a home that you know that 125 people have said no to, you kind of like it, yet it's overpriced because 125 people said no to it. As I said, it's basically you're, you're not positioned properly. What could that agent say to you that would, that would cause you to buy that house that was outside the market. Meaning you're gonna say no to the houses that are in the market or price right, and you're gonna say yes to the house that's overpriced. What could that seller or that seller's agent say to you to cause you to do that? Lower the price? No, no, that's not it. You're, you, you no. What would cause you to pay more for, the, more for a house than a market will bear? Here's the reason I'm asking, Kevin. 
because whatever that script is, give it to me and I'll use it on a potential buyer. If that script would work on you and would cause you to pay more for the house than the market would bear, I'll use it. What would make you pay more? Good. So let's stop. And Nothing. Let's can, I'm sorry? Yeah. Nothing would make me pay more. Well, you take him down that alley. And listen, I, I, was, I, I took my time to painstakingly make him say my marketing wasn't working. Many times in the, in the strategy of a script, you guys, it's kind of like a song. You listen to a song and that it's an ebb and flow and then, you know, and, and to an ending or play. Everything has an ebb and flow and you can get right to the heart of it right away if you want to, which is fine. What I'm attempting to do is I, I, I was attempting to get him into a trap where he says, yeah, marketing wasn't working. I could have told him right off the bat, well, we had 125 people check you out online. However, it wouldn't have had the same impact as, as, as I kind of set him up. I laid it out there for him and he basically was trapped. Now he can run from that. It's his home. The bottom line is this. His initial approach was really good. In fact, he threw, a, he threw a good little wrinkle in there about this other agent said, we're always going to run into that. Don't, don't let that throw you. The bottom line is we know, and that's why the one in three things, you've got to lay that out there up front because you've got, I want him to go, yes, I understand, I understand. And many times, just like this situation, the seller is going to get amnesia and not want to move. And the bottom line is, say, let's say he doesn't, want to, he doesn't want to change his price. All right, Kevin, you don't want to change your price? Yes. Yes, sir. So... I guess what you're saying is you don't want to move to San Diego. Is that correct? Well, if I did lower my price and you could convince me that it was the highest price possible, but less than I wanted, would you take a reduction in the commission? That's a good so, so are you, so are you're asking me to discount my fee to get you the maximum, maximum you can in the market. Does that sound like a win-win? You want to sell for top dollar and you want me to discount my fee? So I'm just trying to be eight or nine here. I'm not, this is not I know, the no, no. Hey, I get it. Now, this is not personal. <laughs> not okay. personal at all. So you I'm just saying. Eight or nine. So, any, all right. So, so, any, my, so my, my answer would be, um, it's you're going to get me the top price, but it's not as much as I would like. Therefore, why I would want to pay you your top price, which is not as much as you would like. Hello? Yeah, I'm here. So I'm just letting okay. that soak in, thinking. And many times, you guys, seriously, <laughs> when somebody's being eight or nine, taking a little bit of time to think, because what's going through your mind is you process this. Don't have to come up with an answer right away because one of the things that's going to go through your mind at some point in time is, is this guy worth it? Yeah. <laughs> My apologies, but sure. No, no, no. No, you're fine. Trying. You're fine. So the, the issue is this, Kevin. Um, I'm not going to discount my fee. You want top dollar and I'm, I can get you top dollar. And I think that basically I can net you more than the other agent. So if I can put more money in your pocket than the other agent, am I worth more? And, and you know what, if you're not happy and I can't make you happy, I'd rather turn you down and let you down. Would you like to just go ahead and rip up the listing right now? Can you, can, how do you convince me that the price you get is the top price? Well, that's, that is the, another discussion that I'll have to show you with my little graph that you've seen before, you guys. And I'll put it up here. I won't take the time to talk about it this time. I should have an assistant, like Vanna. It goes back to top dollar. I would demonstrate to you how I could get top dollar, which is that, that range right there. That's what the one in three things 
is because you price it up here, you got low to no showings. As you get closer to that line, you start to get showings and it will sell at top market value. You price it down here, you get tons of showings and maybe model offers. I, there's just no guarantee you're up here. So I can walk someone through that and we can, I think I did it a week or so ago. Is there anything, thanks, Kevin, you were a nine. You were awesome at it, buddy. Thank you so much. Uh, I hope I don't have a listing like you anytime Thank soon. Thank you. <laughs> so anything before we go, that hour went by fast, anything before we go, remember we're going to have a class, the Thrive class on uh, Thursday, if you want. You got that email, it's in the chat. And then we'll have the, um, the, the Black Belt uh, class will start on Wednesday and then, then it'll pick up the 1st of December. So. Anybody have anything to say before we go? You guys were super quiet. Al, you were super quiet today. David, are you guys playing Candy Crush or what? No. Well, this was awesome. Any any ahas? I mean, was it was it any? Did you learn anything? Throw me a cookie. I learned that being prepared is the best uh, way to keep going over my scripts and um, taking a minute to breathe and um, just trying to come up with the best scenario for the situation and going through my scripts helped me with that. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. Thanks for being on. All right, you guys have an awesome day. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks Bob, Danny. for your participation. Kevin, Thanks, nice job. Thank you, Danny. Thanks, Danny. Thanks. Thanks, David. Thank you.